Well, hey there, Biology 11. We're going to get going with the course, jump right in here with Chapter 18. And that's the um, fourth item here, the six kingdoms and classification. So you'll see the way the structure has been laid out on the course site. Uh, and I'll just zoom in a little bit here so we get a better idea. Um, each of the major topics has been cast into lessons. So you would go ideally to lesson one, lesson two, and then the activities that we do in class are posted here for you. So if you lose your in-class copy or whatever, you're never really disconnected from what you need to grab and download. So these are like lab activities here, one, two, and three. And uh, there's a test prep page there, interactive quiz on classification. You can check it out. And each one of these lessons will have um, expect to see YouTube videos or an embedded flash file that's an animation uh, and things that you can check out take for a test drive and it's um, stuff that you'll see that I'll do I won't show the videos per se because that just takes up a lot of time online I'll pause and say that you should go watch them but when it comes to an animation I will definitely take that out for a spin because it helps me to make my point okay so zoom back out here and I'm going to click on lesson one, classifying living things, and that's what you have here. So here we go. Classification. You'll see that there's three slideshows, 18, 1, 2, and 3. I'm producing the video right now for 18, 1. You've got your um, biology text, your readings here. There's the digital book in parallel there as well. And this is kind of interesting here. I've, I've, I've explained this throughout the course. Um, our Moodle technology that's displaying this web page is showing previews of these things. If you want to see this in full, large size, click that link right there. We're hoping to work on these previews so they don't display like this anymore. So this, click here, and this little guy down here is a little, um, basically a little quiz. Um, but you have to watch out because you need to get the spelling right when you go to when you go to play with that one there. But I digress. So let's get right into it. And I'll do the um, basically the in class notes for section 18.1. Okay, so in we go. Okay, finding order in diversity. Now, when it comes to the living kingdom, what you'll find is that there's a lot of stuff on the planet. There is a huge amount of life on the planet. And um, from the standpoint of being a biologist, you're sort of a librarian first and a scientific, um, a scientific advisor or a scientist second. There's all the stuff we have to take a look at and see how it all belongs together. And then we have to figure out, well, just what's the process for making sure everything fits in to set groupings. And that's what I'll be talking about in this lecture. Okay, so as we go along, um, you should have the uh, slideshow notes in front of you. And it's my hope uh, and my goal that you would fill these in. And if I write in, if I say anything that's interesting, scribble that in. Okay, there's lots of space here. If I annotate or write over top of the slideshow, and I will like crazy, you should do the same. Okay, because I'm making a strong point. So we'll get going with this here. Now, as we go through the course, I'll bring up this topic called natural selection. Right here, natural selection. And what that really is, without getting it too much, is that things of the planet have been bred and they've been tested. And some things have made the cut uh, and some things have not made the cut. They've gone extinct. And some things, as they've made the cut, have changed. It's kind of like a giant um, breeding process over time to see which critters on our planet have the neatest characteristics that help them survive. We have a huge diversity of organisms uh, and I don't think this number is by anywhere near, near accurate. We've n managed to nail down 1.5 million species to date. Well that doesn't mean we found them all. And we're finding uh, new species all the time. And we're having to decide, is this in fact a new species or is this just one that we totally missed? 
So these estimates you have to take with a bit of what I like to say a grain of salt because this is sort of a staggering number of species that have yet to be discovered. You might say, well, what's the big deal? Why, did, why, why are we looking after these new species? You're looking at some animals here, for example, and you don't have to be an animal lover to understand that um, everything living on the planet is connected. Let's put this in another context. Um, when you get sick, the antibiotics, things that we give you, the various medicines, some come from plant sources. You'd be surprised at how a sponge um, is an amazing uh, critter on our planet. It's an animal source that can help produce anti-cancer drugs. So very important. Um, so we definitely want to know about sponges and uh, the diversity in, this, in um, sponges which are phylum periphera. We also want to know about diversity in the plant realm because in the plant realm we get as I say a lot of medicines from there we, uh, a lot of antibiotics as well um, even fungi are notable for their antibiotics we need to know about things on the planet because we need to study them uh, we're all connected there's advantages to knowing um, and categorizing everything on the planet it seems like a big job but there's lots of us don't worry we'll get it done so I spoken to this point fairly extensively we need to get all these organisms in a, a sort of a logical grouping right there are lots of organisms and we have to put them in some kind of order let's see if we can get them into a spreadsheet well it's not quite that simple we do have to make sense of things. So there's a discipline in biology. Um, it's basically what I like to call our, our librarian arm that we call taxonomy. And it's, it's a process we use to classify critters and give them these sort of universal names. In fact, if you look at humans, um, later on the slideshow, we'll, we'll go through and um, mention human scientific names we have a very specific series of names that tags us on this planet nobody else goes all the way down to and you probably heard this before homo sapiens that's us that's our specific identity there is a universal and accepted name for every critter on our planet and this slide is really interesting because it says to me and it should say to you that there have been a lot of critters that have come before and even they had names. Now there's common names, right? Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, and then there's distinct species names that we would have given to different forms. Everything changes. And we try to nail it down with a series of specific names so that we know exactly which one that was on the planet. Okay, so here we go. Now we're getting to it. Assigning a scientific name is very important. So down to the bottom here, you'll see the term Homo sapiens. Now, what they, when we talk about Homo sapiens, something that's a hominid, and I'll just jump out of my slideshow for one second. If you look at something that's a hominid, we have this neat little thing called an opposable thumb. Now, what does an opposable thumb mean? It means that you can touch your um, little finger to, and this, this one more or less kind of shows it, you can touch your thumb to all four of your fingers, including your little finger. So your thumb opposes your fingers, and it, it's an incredible thing that we have. Um, hominids have it, and it gives us the ability to grasp, and not only to grasp, but to manipulate tools. And when we look at various critters that we're related to genetically, and uh, there's some physical similarities, you see that the opposable thumb uh, is a very common sort of characteristic. Now, 
this isn't something, for example, that your dog has. Your dog has a dew claw. And if your dog has, with its front legs has ever jumped up on you and held onto you, you might remember that dew claw, that sharp little claw that can catch you. That's not opposable. We think that the opposable thumb was one of the uh, things that led to our uh, manipulation of tools, the development of our brains. Um, we are the particular line on the evolutionary tree that uh, the opposable thumb and the incredible sort of mental breakthroughs that we were making gave us our particular dominance on the planet. So here we go. So there's your opposable thumb. And it's it's interesting. Um, you know, my thumb's rather big, but I can touch each one of my fingers. right? Not well, not as well as some people, but I can definitely do it. So I'm in the group. So we're homo sapiens. So what makes Homo sapiens as a group so unique? Well, I've kind of mentioned that whole opposable thumb thing. Uh, we also walk in a bipedal fashion. Uh, bipedal means on two feet. We walk upright. And we are a breeding group. Okay, so Homo sapiens can have children with other Homo sapiens. So that identifies us as a, uh, uh, basically as a species and we'll get more into that definition these words right here are in Latin this word and I'll just go up for a second this word as we go through the course you'll learn that the final two names that we're given in our scientific naming always comes down to genus and species species is has a lowercase letter whereas genus always has this uppercase one I'm going to zoom in on that so the way you see this written it, it's actually quite important they used to ask us to underline it and sometimes you'll see these names in in italics but what really matters is that you capitalize the first the genus name and you leave the second one lowercase uh, for species so that's the way we do it. And these are Latin names. And as I've mentioned in the course, the reason they're Latin names is because the most learned individuals originally that were studying biology were members of the clergy of the Catholic Church. And they were speaking Latin. So they gave out these names. Um, Homo sapiens literally means wise man. That might sound sexist, but at the time, it was used to describe a very intelligent species like ourselves. So who came up with this whole Homo sapiens and uh, this two name system? Well, we've got a we've got Carlos Linnaeus to thank for that. And it turns out to be an extremely useful thing. By binomial nomenclature, you can also interchangeably say, and I'm getting tired of brown, so I need to switch out. You can also say this is the scientific name of the organism. So that's another way of saying binomial nomenclature. Two-part scientific name. So here's part one, and there is part two. I always love this one, the familiar dog. Our evolution with dogs goes very, very far back. Um, domestication of animals um, has a broad and, and rich cultural significance for humans. Um, man's best friend, well, they did a lot of guarding of the homestead. They were used in hunting. Just, just an incredible relationship there. Cats, you wonder where the name Felix comes from. Well, cats are almost always in the genus Felis. And then there's different species. So just because you belong to this group doesn't mean you can necessarily breed with every cat you find. Um, if you think about it, your common variety house cat's probably not going to breed with a bobcat. It's probably going to get eaten by it. So if these critters don't breed, they end up in separate groups. Genetically, they start to become different over time. Genetically, behaviorally, they, they really won't come together. So Linnaeus came up with a system of classification. And it was really useful at not only nailing the species, 
right? For us, for example, sapiens. But he got sort of large categories. He kind of moved out from the scientific name and there was more to it than that. Because there's broader classifications. Think about this. A species is a group of a group uh, that within a population that can essentially breed. Okay, so if you think of if you think of humans, we form a very large population, but the, the capability is there to breed. But there's there's things we're related to that we can't breed with, right? Uh, orangutan, chimpanzee, gorilla, etc. So we we think okay, based on that, there must be broader categories, right? We're mammals. There's cats, dogs. They're mammals too. So we start to say, well, we need some more uh, bins for organizing in our um, scientific library. So Carlos Linnaeus came up with um, this system, which we've expanded on even furthest, or sorry, farther. Now this is from smallest to largest. That drives me a little bit crazy. I like to go the other direction, but we can work with this. Species is the most specific. So let's make a little note here. So this is specific. And as we go down, we go to more broad or general, I think would be a, a good definition, degree of relationship. Just so how well related are we? At this point, we're so highly related that we can breed and produce offspring, offspring that can also breed. Now, there's, it, it's interesting because a lot of people talk about the definition of a species. Well, I, I want to mention this one. I know that a horse and a donkey can breed, but they're not the same species. A horse and a donkey produce a mule. Okay, so let's jump out for a second. Species are capable not only of breeding, but the breeding line has to be successful. So let's just jump out for a second here. Um, if we look at a mule, I think everybody's seen a horse and a donkey, a mule is a, um, an incredible pack animal. It's a, it's a beautiful hybrid between horse and donkey, um, but it's not reliably able to reproduce. It's considered to be sterile. It's kind of a dead end. It's a great interbreeding between a horse and a donkey and it shows that they must have some degree of of recent relation but these this this itself can't keep reliably breeding there might be a few exceptions to that but the exceptions don't become the rule they're generally the exceptions so species has to be capable of breeding and then as we move up the ladder um, we get away from that specificity of just breeding and we can say okay horses belong to family uh, something like equus and then we move all the way up to well let's go up to kingdom well they're animals we'll lay all this out for you uh, that it goes from very specific to very general all the way down from sapiens which is what we are to kingdom animal or animalia there's a really broad amount of diversity in between. Oops, jumping out of my slideshow. So each of these levels, from uh, if we go from the top down, which is what I prefer to do, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, This is the way it should be done. The previous slide um, didn't go from the top down. It kind of went from the bottom up. There we go. And there's little rhyming games you can find for these. Kingdom, final class order, family, genus, species. I think um, I've seen various ones. Uh, one was King Philip 
came over for good soup. I mean, if that works for you, King Philip came over for good soup. If that helps you to remember it, I say fly at her. Um, you can go online and you can look up um, all of these rhyming schemes. They're called uh, mnemonic devices. Uh, they help you to or, uh, they help you to um, memorize things. But um, King Philip coming over for good soup. Hey, that one's just as good as any. Let's kind of look at these levels. These are called taxa. Each one of these is a different level, kind of going up the ladder of organizing things. So these are all taxa that I'm drawing arrows at. And the plural of taxon is taxa. And we'll just kind of look at an example of a bear here. Let's say we look at something at the species level. Okay, Ursus arctos. So we're looking at a grizzly bear. Okay, well that's grizzly bears tend to breed with grizzly bears, but what about black bears? Okay, so if we zoom in, we could say, um, well, they belong to the genus Ursus. Now, if you look up into the sky, you might have seen Ursa Major, right? The great bear, and there's Ursa Minor uh, constellations. So you've probably heard the term Ursus before. It means bear-like. Well, let's push this a little bit further. We have the bear-like things. Now, you might know that grizzlies and black bears and polar bears, they're all fairly, they're, they're all ursus. They're definitely bears. But what about things that are sort of bear-like? Like here we've got the giant panda. Well, how does he kind of fit in, or her? Turns out pandas, by the way, have a very hard time breeding in, in captivity. Our little bamboo eaters aren't doing so well. They probably wouldn't exist without us. Well, if we go above a genus, just go what, go above genus Ursus, and you're heading up, okay, we're going sort of to a higher classification, you get to family Ursidae, which means uh, bear-like. And here's a hint. A lot of names within the taxon of a family end in A-E. Cats, for example, end in Felidae. So it's kind of a common naming convention. I'm throwing you a bone there. We can go upwards from a family and start to include more things, but they're not as closely related. So if we go up from family Ursidae, and I'll just write it in, then we could start to include something a little bit more broad. We just say, okay, let's look at all the, uh, let's look at things that are carnivores. So we had the grizzly bear, sure. Black bear fits. Uh, we already had the giant panda. Now, if you've ever noticed dogs and bears, you kind of looked at the similarity. Dogs are older. Um, something along the lines of, uh, you sort of think that a wolf would be the most familiar. You think that would be genetically the oldest? Turns out foxes, their body form is one of the oldest. And I think a fox fits the, the bill of a carnivore. Excellent. So now we can start to include a little bit more dog-like things with the bears. And to belong to carnivora, this would be all things that are just kind of carnivores. And at that point, you know, well, heck, couldn't we include cats? Sure we could, because we're starting to get into a real broad category. But we didn't include cats, because all the other things would have chased it down and eaten it in the last slide. Okay, so now, now we'll go up to a class. So before, we were at order carnivora, the meat eaters, animals that are meat eaters. And if we give up the whole meat eating thing, and we say, okay, let's go with, say, class animalia. And all you have to be to be in, mam in mammalia is, uh, let's just pick a couple general ones. Hair, you produce milk. Um, your uh, warm-blooded, uh, simple three characteristics for a mammal. And now you can include, this is not Albert the squirrel, but this is an 
a bear <laughs> abert squirrel a bear squirrel that's kind of an interesting one not one that i'm familiar with but squirrels fit the bill so we can bring the herb herbivores in because now we've gone past just that carnivore distinction you can see the method to the madness on how this was done moving above where were we at we were just at classes okay so things like mammals now what's above a mammal well, let's go a little higher because let me think animals uh well what about birds reptiles amphibians mammals these are all sort of things that have a something going up their back right like a cord well look what we got here we got phylum chordata and I'm, I'm keeping that very general a cord going up your back what you mean like a vertebral column yeah like a vertebral column and that's kind of an oversimplification for chordata but this guy has a cord going up his back him too him too our friend the squirrel or uh, sorry a red fox our squirrel and I think he's thinking about chowing on him. And we can now include a reptile. We can include a frog. We could include a bird. These are all chordates. Platypus. Flatter. And then we get above a phylum. Now, phylum's a really big group. That last phylum was anything, it's a great distinction. It's a very general thing. You all have to have some kind of uh, stiff rod that goes up your back. There's more to it, but this level, which is the kingdom, is even more general. In order to be an animal, kingdom animalia, the sole requirement to get into that club, into that group, is really that you're a multicellular heterotroph. Now, because you've done your heterotroph, because you've done your terminology homework, you know that, well, you wouldn't have had to do your terminology homework to know what multi-celled is. That's like us. Many cells. And heterotroph means that you eat other things. Okay, you've heard hetero before. It gets used in terms like um, to describe sexuality, heterosexuality. You prefer the opposite sex. Okay. Troph is just a new one, which means to eat. So you eat other things. Isn't Latin wonderful? And that's what we do. We're not plants. We don't, we're not autotrophs. We don't automatically eat the food that we make. So this is it. Belonging to Kingdom Animalia is a breeze. You just have to be cruising around eating other things and have many cells in your body okay if we look at this and it, it doesn't quite do the whole system justice but what we've got and I always found this rather interesting is we have this kind of inverted well not pyramid but you get the idea this inverted triangle structure where you're super general as long as we keep the biggest category, kingdom on top, the triangle will form this way, right? Because it goes from broad all the way down to super specific. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then we get down to species. So we go down a level. Here all you have to do is have many cells and you eat other things. Even a starfish is in that group. Let's get specific. If we go down to phylum chordata, you have to have a, a rod that goes up your spine, more or less, with a few other characteristics. Well, starfish is out. Okay, so we're getting more specific. If we go down to class mammalia, hmm, the snake does not fit the bill. Got it? So we're class mammalia. All these are all mammals. We go down to order carnivora. Squirrel's out. We go down to family... Um, we're at order carnivore, we go down to family ursidae. If you're not bear-like, you're gone. So you can see that we start to get to something very specific. Genus ursus, sorry panda, you're gone. And get right down to um, species arctos, and there's the black bears out. And we're down to 
our sole solitary critter. Now, this critter belongs to Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Carnivora, Family Ursidae, Genus Ursus. But it's so specific, there's only one of these things, right? And it just happens to be able to breed with other members of its species. Right? There's our grizzly bear. So this is this has just been a, uh, a generalized, broad, I hope somewhat interesting, lecture on how uh, the scientific name was devised by Carlos Linnaeus and how we use kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, or the various levels of taxa in a a study we call taxonomy to specify exactly which critter we're talking about on this planet. Um, because if we're going to study it and catalog it and know it, we have to know exactly which um, critter it is. And this, at the species level, that's, that's the most useful thing to be at. That's the most specific category. Okay, so let's pop out of here. Now that you've had a chance to take in uh, the slideshow you'd be looking at, you'd be uh, going back to um, the course website saying okay really what's next well if you haven't already um, take this in this is a little introduction a uh, little character group here uh, a robot and a, a kid named Moby and they kind of talk about these things kind of neat Tim and Moby you might have seen them before with brain pop and you need to go through uh, these two Okay, the history of taxonomy, that might be a little boring for some, but it's still useful. And I am going to move on and do classification 18.2 because, well, it's 11.30 and I'm wide awake and I might as well get her done. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you out there.